We started three weeks ago a series called This Might Sound Crazy, where we're taking a look at some concepts and ideas and words that a lot of church people and Christians throw around that, well, to the average person, sound strange and they sound weird. Uh, we began uh, in week one talking about, you know, this invisible friend we have in the sky that we talk to. This God that no one can see, but uh, I have a relationship with him and how crazy that must sound to some people. And we took a look at atheism and what the Bible has to say about atheism. Of course, we realized, first off, atheism isn't new. Atheism is, is not enlightened or progressive. Nothing about it is. In fact, as long as there have been believers, there have been unbelievers and skeptics living right alongside of them, as long as there have been people. But what we found that the Bible tells us about atheism is this. This is the Bible's perspective to the atheist. God exists and you know it. And there's no getting around it because his invisible, yes, invisible attributes have been made clear through what he has made. Yes, design and order are enough to indicate meaning. Now you have the freedom to deny that and you can refuse to believe that God exists. It may be more convenient for you. The Bible does point out that if you do choose to not believe God exists, um, check yourself because it probably is connected to a sense of moral accountability. I mean, just real talk. That's what the Bible says. So we took a look at Romans chapter 1 that tells us these things. And then we look at Romans chapter 2 last week where we talked about this moral accountability. And we found out not only do you already know God exists, but you already know God has moral expectations and your conscience confirms it. Plain and simple. Your conscience will wake up and say, hey, wait a minute, man, as soon as somebody violates God's rules, right? No one had to tell you, don't steal. But when somebody steals from you, you know somebody's in violation. Your conscience bears witness. In fact, any uh, basic secular philosophy class will tell you about morality. Well, it's basically each person has their own set of values. We call these morals. Two or more people that share morals, we call that ethics. And then a group of people will form a consensus on their ethics, and ethics is the basis of politics. <clears throat> like that ever worked. But in an academic utopia, that's how it's supposed to work. But we all know better than that. Come on, what if your ethics are trash, right? What if I round up a group of white supremacists and they decide that racism is a family value? No, it's not. You see, morals can't come from within yourself. Morals are dictated by one who is superior, in this case, God. The inmates can't run the asylum after all. It's the old, the old corporation, right, that gets accused of a scandal and they say, we have conducted an internal investigation and we found nothing wrong with ourselves, right? It's, it doesn't work like that. We all know better than that. So then we got to the big question, Romans chapter two. Can't I just be good without God? I mean, I have dear friends who believe this. I don't need some invisible boogeyman threatening me to be good. I can be good. I can love people and be a nice person. Can I be good without God? Yes. That's Romans chapter 2. Can I be good enough without God? No. And that's Romans chapter 3, where we are today. Okay? But we're going to take a look, first of all, at this word good and how crazy it is to some people that Christians like you and I throw this phrase out, God is good, 
all the time, right? And all the time, God is good. Seriously? Don't you watch the news? There's earthquakes, there's wildfires, there's a hurricane going on, I think, today. God is good. We have humanitarian crises in Afghanistan and in South Texas. God is good. Closer to home, we had, unfortunately, teenagers got shot at the local high school here on Friday. We had lightning strike one of our church members' houses this week. God is good? I'd say the construction on Route 1 is enough to convince you God isn't good. (laughs) But it begs this question. You see, if chaos and disorder are all it takes to prove to you that God doesn't exist, think about where that came from. Perhaps there's an instinct in you that says, design and order prove that God exists. See Romans chapter one. Think about that. I mean, I can take a box of Legos. I got, we got too many Legos in our house, but a big box of Legos, all jumbled up. But if three of them are put together, I already know somebody's been in the Legos. Just a little bit of order is all you need to know. Somebody's been here. So don't take some, uh, you point out some chaos and disorder and see that proves that no one has been here. Because I can certainly point to you lots of, lots of examples of design and order that even the best scientists can't explain. Of course, the Bible already told you that. That God exists and you know it, and his invisible attributes have been made clear. So why do we say that God is good? Why do we call God good? Well, that's not a new question either. In Mark chapter 10, there was a rich young ruler that went to Jesus and he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Fair question. Perhaps if you can answer that question, you're on your way to understanding salvation and eternal life. Once you understand the goodness of God. Now, before we really get into it, I want to uh, take a moment. I want to put a picture up on the screen. We're going to have a little fun with this for a few minutes. I'm a sucker for silly cops and silly cop shows. Even as a kid, I, I loved Barney Fife. Remember Barney Fife? Uh, uh, Roscoe P. Coltrane, right? Some of my favorite goofy cops, Sledgehammer. He wasn't really a cop, but loved Sledgehammer. And these were cops who were just fumbling along, trying to make judgment calls on who's good and who's bad, but they were just really clumsy about the way they did this. Well, the truth is, when we make judgment calls about what is good and bad, we can also be equally and intellectually clumsy and silly in the way that we do it, okay? Let's go ahead to the next slide. So we're gonna, we're gonna play the goodness police today, okay? And I'm going to talk to you about four traps that we fall in when it comes to making judgments. Four delusions of goodness, if you will. They may sound silly, but trust me, these are all based on real people and real life conversations that I have had. And these are honest to God worldviews that people have in their approach to Christianity and God. Okay? First one. Judging from a distance. Oh, you know them. The backseat driver. The armchair quarterback, right? The pundits. This really comes out in me, I noticed this year, uh, watching the Olympics. I don't know anything about gymnastics. I couldn't do a somersault 
without cracking a rib, right? But I'll sit there and I'll watch the gymnast tumble and flip and twist and do all this stuff. And then, you know, oh, well, he hopped at the end. I'm not. <laughs> Her foot was on the line. You got to stick that landing. I'm not impressed. The splash was a little too big. Oh, he ran the race in 10.5 seconds. He ran it in 10.4 seconds last time. He's slowing down. And all of a sudden, we become this judge like we know what we're talking about. We're not in the race. We're not in the game. We're just making judgment calls. A lot of people like to look at the Christian faith like that, don't they? They're waiting to find the flaw, waiting to find the mistake. Oh, I read about this pastor on the internet, and he said some bad words, and they caught it on voicemail. Yeah. Yeah. Or one of my favorites is, you can't trust Christians. I don't believe in Christianity because, you know, the Crusades. Yeah. They did some terrible stuff. Yeah, there were, there were Christians, some Christians who did some terrible things. Yeah, in the 10 hundreds, a thousand years ago. And you take that as a reason not to believe any of it. Talk about judging from a distance. These are people who will say, you know, well, the Bible contradicts itself. It says this over here and it says something else over here. And you say, well, okay, let's, let's pull it out. Let's read it and look. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not reading it. Keep the distance. With one arm extended, they keep God at a distance. And with the other one, they're wagging their finger at him, right? It's the people who, who won't come to church, but they'll tell me 101 things that our church ought to be doing, right? Yeah. Judging from a distance. Jesus calls these people out in Matthew 15. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Now, as silly as judging from a distance sounds, that's actually the most rational approach of the four traps we will fall in. They will decrease in rationality as we go. Here's the next crazy one here. Judging from, I'm sorry, judging without self-awareness. Judging without self-awareness. We've seen them all, right? It's the filthy, rich, anti-capitalist raging against the millionaire class from their mansion, right? Or it's the conservative pundit who's ranting against big tech and Facebook and Twitter and how terrible they are, and then they end the show with what? Follow me on Facebook and Twitter, right? <laughs> yeah. Judging without self-awareness. Jesus calls this out in Matthew chapter seven. Why do you look at the wooden speck in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the wooden log in your own eye? Mm -hmm. This is the person who likes to judge whether or not God is good or bad because somehow in their mind, their life story shows that they are somehow a fine judge of all things that are good and true, right? As they sit there and judge everybody for being judgy. Judgy McJudgerson, right? It's like a sport to them. Here's a fun one. Judging from total ignorance. Now, I I am guilty of this. My wife and I will watch like the Food Network. And I'm sitting there, there's no way this tastes good. Right? I don't know anything about it. But I just, I already know it doesn't taste good. In fact, I will confess to you, I'm going to make somebody mad with this, but I have have never tried a veggie burger. Never tried it. You can tell me what's in it. I don't care. It sounds awful. (laughs) It might be delicious, but I will deliberately remain ignorant and judge it (laughs) and never try it. I will judge from my total ignorance. Politicians are great at this one. Somebody will introduce a bill and they'll vote no. Did you read the bill? No. Well, it came from that other guy and it must be full of bad ideas. 
So they just already judge it. We got people that do this to our Bible. They do this to God. They'll quote verses that aren't verses, right? <laughs> They'll say things like, well, you know, these Christians, they have this Bible in the Old Testament. God is this mean bully who's egomaniac, who's bipolar and vindictive. And then the New Testament, God is this, you know, flower tree hugging, kind, loving, forgiving, merciful God. See, it's crazy. You can't trust it. Listen, you don't know anything about the Bible, if that's what you think. In fact, most of the verses about God being gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and full of mercy, they're Old Testament verses. And if you think the New Testament God um, doesn't inflict wrath, just keep reading. <laughs> you didn't get to that part yet. You get to the end of the book. He's, he's still got it. These are the people that say, well, look at Noah and the flood. God just wiped everybody out. That's a terrible God. We just got mad and killed everybody, even the innocent women and children. Where did that phrase come from anyway? I don't know. The innocent women and children. We're going to Romans 3 today. We're going to read that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, even the innocent women and children. But I'm not going to say any more about that because I want to stay married. All right. <laughs> But what kind of God just kills everybody? That's unreasonable. But they didn't tell you the whole first half of the story. The Bible says that God was warning them and Noah was building an ark for 120 years. How many generations went by getting warned? There's a flood, there's a flood, there's a flood, there's gonna be a flood. I'm telling you, there's, animals are lining up. There's going to be a flood. That's a pretty patient God. Jesus labels this one, like in Matthew 15, 14, he, he compares this to, to blind guides. He says, leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind guide leads the blind, both of them will fall into the pit. But we have a lot of blind guides in our world. And they're telling our kids things about the Bible and about God that are not at all about the Bible and about God. It's happening in schools. I've known, I've seen it. I've watched it happen. Kids who tell me uh, all this crazy stuff about the Bible. I'm like, where did you hear that? Oh, my teacher said it. Listen, your teacher don't know anything about the Bible. Come on. Judging from total ignorance. But as crazy as that one, there's, there's still one more that's even more irrational than this. Here it is. Judging with cognitive dissonance. Yeah. This is the guy that walks up and says, you know, we, we've, you, you've seen these pictures from Mars. Like, we went up there and we took a bunch of pictures and video. You've seen it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a mess. What a dump. What a wasteland it is. Yeah, well, it's Mars. No, I'm telling you, these Martians, they don't know how to run a planet. Look what they've done to the place. Uh, you, you believe in Martians? No, I don't believe in Martians. What are you, crazy? It's silly, but this is a legit worldview. There are people who will say there is no God. And also, I hate him. Yeah, this is a real thing. There are people who have so much to say, so much pent-up rage against a God they literally don't believe exists, but somehow lives rent-free in their head, right? Cognitive dissonance. Hebrews 11 tells us that if anyone wants to draw near to God, he must first believe he exists. Well, I would add, if anybody wants to bash God, you must first believe he exists. Let's have a little cognitive harmony here, right? A little consistency. Which brings us to our text, Romans chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you can look up Romans chapter 3. Now, the context of this, he's talking, you hear a lot of talk about Jews versus Gentiles. And in the context, the topic of discussion is belief 
morality, sin, salvation, things like that. It's not a context of, of some sort of racial difference. That's not what he's digging at. He's talking about the people who have the scripture, in this case, the Jews, who are a small minority living in where? Rome. They are surrounded by Romans who are Gentiles, who don't have the Bible, and then, of course, the nearby Greeks, right? And this question comes up. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. So what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? It's considerable in every way. Because first, they were entrusted with the spoken words of God. So listen. These are Jews responding to what Paul just said in chapter 2, where he said, even the Gentiles who don't have the law still instinctively obey it. Remember we read that? So Jesus is saying, well, what's the point of having the scripture? What's the point of having the law? What's the benefit of having it? And Paul says, it's actually, the benefits are considerable in every way. Take this as an encouragement, particularly those of you here who may be younger. The fact that your parents have raised you in church and have tried to make sure you are learning the Bible I know you don't want to hear this right now. It will benefit you later in life. It will. It will come back in life, and you will be glad you know what you know. Let's continue reading. Romans chapter 3, verses 3, continuing. He says, so what then? Well, if some did not believe, will their unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? Absolutely not. God must be true, even if everyone is a liar. We talk a lot and joke a lot about cancel culture. You've heard this phrase. People love to cancel people for all sorts of things, right? And good grief, has Jeopardy found a host yet? Right? It's just a revolving door. They keep getting canceled. You know, I, I know the day is coming where one of these messages is going to get canceled. It's going to get censored, right? You know, they're going to find out that, like, in the, in, in the late 80s and early 90s, I watched the Cosby show, and I liked it. I laughed a lot. I even got the DVDs. I'll probably get canceled for that. That's just the world we live in. But listen, to the skeptic, to the one who's on the run, you can cancel me. You can cancel the pastor. You can cancel church. You can cancel your mommy. You can cancel your daddy. You can cancel your whole Christian family. Cancel all your Christian friends and block them. You don't even see their posts. There's one thing you cannot cancel. The faithfulness of God will not, shall not, cannot be canceled. Hallelujah. Sounds like a pretty good God. Even in your unbelief, this verse says, God is still faithful to you. He's still faithful, and there's nothing you can do to cancel it. God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Yep. So cancel all you want. God will remain faithful. You can call everybody a liar, this verse says. You can call me fake, call the pastors fake, call church fake, call all this religion stuff fake. But there will come a time in your life when you need God to be real. There are people in Baton Rouge today. It's getting a little windy down there. They may have rejected, rejected the faith, but they need God to be real right now. Go ahead and call everybody else a liar. But the day will come. Let's continue reading Romans chapter 3, verse 4. He says, as it is written, that you may be justified 
in your words and triumph when you judge. Let's continue, verse five. But if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, then what are we to say? He says, I use a human argument. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? There's your Noah question. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? Absolutely not. Otherwise, how will God judge the world? Continue reading. But if by my lie, God's truth is amplified to his glory, then why am I also still judged as a sinner? Why not say, just as some people slanderously claim, we say, let's do what is evil so good may come. Their condemnation is deserved. Listen, this is a, this, this is a problem, church. Sometimes we get so focused on the product that we don't really take care of the process. You find this a lot, especially in larger churches. They put on a nice glossy show on Sunday. But during the week, ooh, it's a hot mess. Shenanigans, shady things going on. But they think as long as it comes off looking good on Sunday, we're all right. God blessed it. Mm -mm. Judas betrayed Jesus, which ultimately led to Jesus' crucifixion and salvation. Judas is still a sinner. It's still Judas' sin. It makes me sick when I hear Christians talk about the good things that came from slavery. I just want to mention that. Slavery is a sin. Don't let that be your reputation. That sin is somehow okay if something good comes out on the other end. No, no, no. That is not the will of God. Let's continue reading Romans chapter 3. This is where he drops the final hammer. So what then? Are we, talking about Jews, are we any better? Not at all. Now, he did point out they have the benefits because they, they learned the scriptures. They grew up learning the Bible. And the benefits of that are considerable in every way, he says. But are we better? No. No. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Righteous is just a fancy Bible word that means somebody that always does what's right. There's no one that always does what's right, okay? No, nobody, <laughs> all right? Follow the cancel culture to the end and we will all be canceled, all right? That's the end game. Jeopardy will never find a host. There is no one righteous. No, not one. He continues to talk about how everyone has turned away. In the interest of time, I'm going to kind of skip over the next few verses because we're going to get to the big one, Romans 3.23, which you, I've alluded to. Here we go, Romans 3.23 he leads up, he's saying, look, so is between Jews and Gentiles, there's no distinction. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What are they justified by? His grace as a good God. That's a good God. We've all fall short. If you saw a little man that was four foot seven teasing another little man who's four foot six, that would seem kind of silly, wouldn't it? I mean, neither one of them are going to win the slam dunk contest. They will fall short. We're going to stop reading right there because verse 25 talks about the blood. And that's next Sunday's topic. It's communion Sunday. 
So we're going to talk about what is this blood stuff Christians talk about? It sounds weird and crazy and, and macabre. It's, we're going to look at that next week. So that's verse 25. If you peek ahead, that's where we're going. But I want to wrap up uh, with a thought. I already mentioned to you that well, I like watching the Olympics, and it makes me a very judgy person, right? Uh, something different kind of happened this week, though. My kids and I started watching the Paralympics. Ever watch this? Oh, get the tissues. You watch this, and you won't believe how much your perspective changes. You're not sitting there pointing out the flaws anymore. You're watching with your jaw dropped. And how in the world are they doing this? This man just did a triathlon. He swam across the Tokyo Harbor, and he's completely blind. How in the world is he doing this? You find yourself cheering just for all of them to make it to the finish line. It's funny how your perspective changes, isn't it? Watching the one-armed swimmer. Watching this lady in the wheelchair do 5,000 meters, averaging 17 miles an hour with no legs. It's humbling. But it totally changes your perspective. What if instead of looking at each other as spiritual Olympians we saw each other as spiritual Paralympians. Because see, the truth is, if you only knew how spiritually challenged I am, how spiritually impaired I am, how spiritually stunted and spiritually disabled I am, you wouldn't be pointing out my flaws. <laughs> You'd be cheering me on that how in the world does this man even have a ministry and a wife and kids and, a, and find blessing and peace in his life? I'm poor in spirit. I'm a spiritual Paralympian. And just like all of them, we've all got stories to tell about what we've overcome to get where we are. But to answer the question, how do we do it? It might sound crazy, but three words. God is good. And you can't tell me he's not. That's the truth. Next week, we'll pick up in verse 25. We got a couple more weeks to go. I hope you'll stick with us and come on back as we explore this topic some more. But I'm going to leave you with one quick illustration. I wish I could take credit for it, but it's actually from the great Norman Geisler. He talks about the goodness of God reigning on everyone and the mercy of God that is offered to everyone. He said it's like holding two cups under a waterfall, except one is facing up and one is facing down. The waterfall is there for both of them. The grace of God, the mercy of God, salvation is available to everyone. Which way is your cup facing is the question. The question is, is not, is God good or not? He is, and you know it. You need him to be. If he wasn't, you wouldn't be here. You can't cancel the faithfulness of God. Which way is your cup facing? Think about that.